as we share in a word about Esther, chapter 3 this week. I wanted to ask um, if you have ever taken one of the, um, you know, those online personality quizzes, like which friend's character are you, and you answer all the questions. Now I need to know, Ian, which Godzilla character are you? I would think so, yeah. <laughs> ah, that's a, now I'm, now I'm, I'm going to stand over here. But, well, if you're wondering about friends, I, I, I took the quiz. I, I'm Chandler, apparently. Um, or another one, uh, which Harry Potter character are you? And apparently I'm Neville Longbottom. At, yeah, right. <laughs> Come on, Godzilla. Um, so I, I also, um, I, I was going to have us all take a Peanuts quiz together, but I realized it would take like the entire hour because we would have to agree on each answer and we're Methodists and I don't know if we would agree. So, um, I, so here they are. These are the, the and, and just take a, take a gander and just consider to yourself, prayerfully consider which nut am I? I, I, I did, by the way, I did take the quiz. Um, and, and who do you think I am? Charlie, right? That's what I, I, I mean, we got the same hair. And people used to call me Charlie Brown. No, not, not Charlie Brown. Apparently, I'm Marcy. <laughs> right? She's, by the way, she's the Neville Longbottom of Peanuts characters, I, I think. So, so there you go. Well, if you haven't noticed, um, we, we've been playing a, a similar game this, this Lent with the book of Esther, only instead of picking one character, um, I think Esther does a pretty masterful job of inviting us over the course of the book to see ourselves in each character. You see, uh, if, if only, I, I think, if only we're willing to look truly at these characters and look truly at ourselves. And that's what we're doing throughout the season of Lent. We're on a journey through the Old Testament book of Esther and we're peeling away these layers, these costumes that we wear, these roles that oftentimes people put on us in life or that we put upon ourselves, the facades that we hide behind. Because Lent is all about returning to the people that God created us to be. Amen. And so in the first chapter of Esther, we were invited to see ourselves in King Ahasuerus of Persia as masters of the houses of cards that we sometimes build around our lives, only to see those houses come tumbling down when an unseen wind blows into town. I think sometimes the truest test of our character is not how big a house we can build, but how we respond when it inevitably falls apart. The second chapter introduced us to Esther and Mordecai, the heroes of our story, only they're not heroes, not yet. And so speaking of cards, these two reminded us of that age-old saying, right? Sometimes you have to know when to hold them and you have to know when to fold them. Right. It, it feels all wrong for us to consider keeping our faith hidden. But remember, Esther uses, shows us that God uses us when we're living our faith out loud and even when we're living our faith on the down low. God still uses us. We've all been there in, in both of those places. We've all had Ahasuerus days. We've all had Vashti days when we refuse to play the role others write for us. We've had Esther days and Mordecai days. Well, chapter 3 is a hard day because chapter 3 introduces us to the last major character in Esther, the villain to end all villains, like he was the original mustache twirler, Haman. It's not, you got it. And so today, we're, we're invited to consider our inner Hamans. So if the quiz today were which character from Esther am I, today's answer is I am Haman. And so here is chapter 3, and these, this is verse 1 through 11. 
There we are. It's on chapter 14, by the way, or page 14, if you have your Esther with you. After these things, we read, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were at the gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day, and he would not listen to them, they told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For he had told them he was a Jew. He was a Jew. And then Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him. Haman was filled with fury. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. And so in the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pur, that is, they cast lots, before Haman day after day, and they cast it month after month until the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. And then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws, so that is, it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. If it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed." And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, that they may put it into the king's treasuries. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, The money is given to you, the people also, to do with them as it seems good to you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. That was a hard thanks be to God, wasn't it? <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you, though, and we praise you in all things because you bring just the right things at just the right time. And so, Lord, I pray to you today that you would bring a word to each and every one of us, that we would hear from you. You know our hearts. You know our inmost beings. So speak, for we are listening. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So how many of us would admit, I heard myself in Haman's story today? Like... How many of us could imagine taking the Esther quiz and it coming up, you are Haman. Yay, I want to tell that. I'm not going to post that on my Facebook page, right? But while hopefully none of us have ever had a, 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 a genocidal reaction to another human being, I imagine we've all maybe found ourselves in Haman's general situation. And I'll put it to you today that there is more than one way that you might see yourself in Haman. There are three ways, actually. And they all revolve around his reaction to Mordecai. So first, let's, let's take it at face value. King Ahasuerus makes Haman second in command. Why? We have no idea. This is the first we've heard of him. It's been 12 years. It's 12 years into Ahasuerus' reign. Five years after, after Esther has become queen. And everyone, we read, all the king's men at the gate bowed down before Haman just as the king commanded, everyone that is, except for who? Mordecai, right? And that slight did not go unnoticed. You ever been slighted before? You ever been disrespected? You ever earned something? Maybe, maybe an award or an honor, and, and you worked really hard for it, and then you had someone completely ignore what you'd accomplished. It kind of hurts, doesn't it? 
We all yearn for recognition. From the days when we're a kid, and you know that first time you did the dishes or you vacuumed the floor without being asked and you just waited for your parents to acknowledge what you did? We want recognition. And as parent, as a parent, like I know, if I don't recognize that first time they did that, it's not going to happen again. <laughs> so I got to I got to I got to sing praises that day. Anyone ever have a promotion or a friend get a promotion in a job and all of a sudden they're not your friend anymore? It messes with relationships. I was down um, at First United Methodist in Sedalia the last couple of days for a meeting, and, and I took a moment, I was poking around my old stomping ground, and, and this memory hit me of one, one day evening when I was in the church. I'd, 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 I popped in, it was, a, it was a Saturday evening, and I was grabbing uh, something from my office, and I'd been out working in my yard, so I had like my scruffy sweatshirt, you know, grass-stained shoes and jeans, and and I noticed there was an issue in one of the bathrooms. I could hear the toilet running, and I opened it up, and sure enough, the toilet's running on the floor. Um, and so I popped down, you know, I, I grabbed I grab the mop trolley, and I'm like going down the, the hallway, and, and there's some people that were in the building looking for a baby shower, and I'd never seen them before, and so naturally they look at me and they say, oh, are you the janitor? Do you know where the baby shower is? And I was caught off guard. I'm like, janitor? I'm the pastor, (laughs) right? (laughs) And I I, I said it like that, actually. I'm like, no, I'm the pastor. (laughs) In my scruffy jeans, in my grass-stained shoes, in my comfy sweatshirt, and the mop in my hand. And then there was a a bit of silence. (laughs) And some awkwardness as they were like, are you done? (laughs) And I'm, the the shower's that way, and I just shuffled on (laughs) with my mop. (laughs) Embarrassed by my un-Jesus like moment of vanity. Especially, by the way, since toilets have been a part of my calling since the beginning. My first day as a pastor in Cole Camp, I still remember that I had to plunge the elementary school kids' toilet. Welcome to ministry. And my tie may or may not have took a dip <laughs> while I was doing that. As humble as God tries to keep me, us, vanity creeps in. I mean, not massacre level vanity, but I'd be lying if I said I can't see any part of myself in Haman's pride. We all have our moments. And what about Mordecai? You know, why didn't he bow? You know, Jews, by the way, have been bowing to foreign dignitaries since the days of Abraham and Sarah. This isn't something that's never done. So why not bow to Haman? It's helpful here to remember that we've added chapters and verses to to our books of the Bible. We've, We've added those later on. They're not original to the Bible And so originally, you would read the end of chapter 2, and then, right, it's just the next word is what we call chapter 3. There would be no pause. And so we read at the end of chapter 2, when Mordecai literally saves the king's life, he gets nothing to show for it but his name in a forgotten book. He saved the king's life. That's where we end chapter 2. And then immediately we slide into Haman's rise with no reason to show for it. Mordecai saves the king, and Haman, he just gets straight to the top. We don't hear why, at least not in this book. You ever found yourself in that position? I'm not going to bow down for that guy. What did he deserve? What did she deserve to have that honor? I mean, I saved the king's life for crying out loud, and you want me to bow down to that person I've never heard of until today? Pride's a wicked thing sometimes. But actually, I have to be honest, that's doing Mordecai a disservice because Mordecai does tell the king's servants at the gates exactly why he doesn't bow down, right? Do you remember? Mordecai says, it's because I am a Jew. And first off, I'm like, whoa, Mordecai, the truth will set you free. You know, you told Esther, don't tell him that you're a Jew. And Mordecai, Mordecai turns around and does just that. He tells the truth. He doesn't keep it hidden. And what does telling the truth get him? A massacre. 
But chances are, you know, people already knew Mordecai's religious and ethnic background, especially if he'd risen that high from the company that he kept, the customs that he kept. I mean, typically, I don't know about you, but I like to put Mordecai in Daniel's camp and say that he wasn't bowing down and paying homage to Haman because as a Jew, he's not supposed to make an idol out of other human beings, right? Mordecai is staying true to his one true God, only we know, all the original readers know, again, Jews have been bowing down to foreign dignitaries since the time of Abraham and Sarah. Bowing down before humans um, of some importance. Bowing down is a cultural thing. It doesn't mean we're worshiping or idolizing. It just means we're acknowledging who someone is. But there's something in this text that the original readers would have picked up on that maybe you or I didn't. You see, maybe it's an issue of pride why Mordecai and Haman do this, or maybe it's an issue of genealogy. Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha. If you didn't know, an Agagite is a descendant of Agag, an ancient king of the Amalekites. And the Amalekites are ancient enemies of the Israelites. Amalek was a grandson of Esau, brother of Jacob. Jacob's sons, you might remember, the 12 tribes of Israel, went and spent 430 years in Egypt. And when Moses was leading them back through the wilderness in the Promised Land, the Amalekites attacked. The Israelites. It's kind of a famous scene because there they are. Um, Moses sends Joshua down to lead the battle, not Jericho, but lead the battle against the Malachites. And every time Moses raises up his staff, right, the Israelites begin to win the battle. And every time he lowers his arms, what happens? The tide turns. And so eventually you have Moses up there and he has to have helpers on either side holding up his arms to keep the staff in the air so that the Israelites could win. Later, as Moses spoke his final words to the Israelites in the book of Deuteronomy, right before they they go into the promised land, he spoke God's command that the Israelites blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, kill all the Amalekites. Every last one. Clearly there's some bad blood between the Israelites and the Amalekites. And it gets worse because Samuel, the priest and prophet, anointed Saul as the first ever king of the Israelites. And they're fighting the Amalekites once again. And Samuel gives Saul a command from God. Destroy all the Amalekites. Destroy everyone, including their livestock, including their king, Agag. But Saul spares the best livestock and he spares the life of Agag. And that's the moment, by the way, that God rejects Saul as king over the Israelites. Which brings us to Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjaminite. Saul was also a Benjaminite, and Kish was his father. So Esther's Jewish audience would have heard Mordecai, a descendant of Saul, refuses to bow down before Haman, a descendant of Agag. That's a whole different story, isn't it? That's like Mordecai, a Hatfield, refuses to bow down before Haman, a McCoy. Mordecai, the son of a Jayhawk, refused to bow down before Haman, the tiger. Right? Mordecai, a Montague, refused to bow down before Haman, a Capulet. And speaking of Romeo and Juliet, anybody ever read that? If you went to high school here, you did, I know. Oh, well, haha, <laughs> you were supposed to. Um, so anyone remember why the Montagues and the Capulets hated each other? You remember what, what it says in, in Romeo and Juliet about why they hate each other? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. You don't, no one remembers. The Montagues and the Capulets didn't even remember why they hated each other. No, the characters don't remain. It's an ancient grudge with no context, no reason beyond the hatred. I can't help but think here are Mordecai the Benjaminite and Haman the Agagite. An ancient grudge had become a new mutiny. You ever been there? Like, why don't you like her? Why don't you like that guy? Why don't we like them? I don't know. We just never did. When I was growing up, it was Kentucky. Why don't you like Kentucky? I don't know, because they're down there. Right? And the jokes we told on Kentucky, 
I moved to Illinois and they told the same jokes about the people from Indiana. I was like, hey, wait, no, that's Kentucky. That's not, uh, uh, right? I, I did dramatic interpretation in high school forensics. We didn't like the debaters. And they didn't like us. Why? I don't know. It always been that way. It was an ancient grudge. Granted, it was a very nerdy ancient <laughs> grudge. I think it probably had to do something to the fact like we stuck to the script and the debaters could like talk us out of our shoes before we even realized it. And so you wouldn't know what you believed anymore after a five-minute conversation with one of the debaters. So we just like, I don't like you. And so after the Benjaminites don't bow down to the Agagite, we realize that this moment is so much bigger than Mordecai and Haman. This is an ancient grudge. And because Saul didn't kill Agag when he was supposed to wipe out all the Amalekites, now it's time for an Amalekite to wipe out all the Jews. Enemies. Enemies. Although, you know, sometimes it's good to have enemies because there's nothing like a common enemy to bring us all together, right? That brings us to a third potential way we might see ourselves in Haman because think about it. I'm not alone in thinking Washington probably feels more divided than ever <laughs> this last decade or so. The two sides of the aisle feel like one, one of them is in India and the other one's in Ethiopia and the Persian Empire is between them, right? They can't agree on anything. They haven't agreed on a- anything for ages until now. Toss Russia into the mix, an ancient grudge if you lived through the Cold War like me. I mean, you remember action movies back from the 80s and 90s? You need a bad guy, make him Russian, right? (laughs) That's what we did. Now that Putin is committing atrocities in Ukraine, it didn't take long for Russia to leapfrog over China and ISIS and Kim Jong-un to become public enemy number one again. And Congress is actually passing things together that aren't along party lines. There's nothing like a common enemy to bring unity Ukrainians are the good guys. Russians are the bad guys. The world is black and white again. We can all be friends except for them. (laughs) Except when I was driving through Sedalia this weekend, it wasn't that easy. If you didn't know, Sedalia, I, I learned this when I moved there, I had no idea that Sedalia has one of the highest percentages of their population of Ukrainians and Russians of any city in the United States. And I'm driving, and, and there's a church on the side of the road. And I remember the, 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 the name of the church. It's a Russian and Ukrainian church. And so there are Russian and Ukrainian church members together standing out there raising money for Ukraine. And I'm like, wait, no, 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 no. You're an ancient grudge. You're not supposed to stand together. Russians, bad. Ukrainians, good. That's what we're... What's... No. Why aren't you enemies? Don't mess with my nice and tidy, neat, clearly drawn lines. Agagites and Jews. No, we don't do that. I mean, like masks, right? A year ago, I could tell you everything you needed to know about someone wearing a mask, and I could tell you everything you needed to know about my delusional neighbor without one, right? <laughs> like that, <laughs> that was easy. Nothing like a common enemy to give you a little political boost, right? It's like a flavor of the month club. You need to climb the political ladder, just name an enemy. Unite your base and we're moving on up. Nothing can unite people together like uniting against pure evil. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Right? Go Chiefs or really anyone who's playing against Tom Brady who's playing again. Come on, man. Make a choice and stick with it. I remember when I joined a fraternity in college and one of the first things we learned were all the songs that slammed every other rival enemy fraternity and told us we sang how bad they were, right? No better way to unite a bunch of clueless freshmen (laughs) than a common enemy. And after Haman sings of the evils of the Jews to Ahasuerus, he literally gets the keys to the kingdom. We have, a king, we have a common enemy. Here's my signet ring. Do whatever you want. It's all up to you, Haman. No better way to climb a political ladder than to single out an enemy. The character 
you are most like is Haman the Agagite? The son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews? Surely not. And yet, when have we been led astray by pride and turned another human being into an enemy, even just for a moment? When have we held on to an enemy of our parents or our grandparents, viewed someone as an enemy just because those people, those people have always been our enemies? It's just easier that way. The world makes sense that way. No need to get to know them because I know them. Or when have we created an enemy out of someone or something or some belief just so we can get ahead? Or when have we found ourselves defining ourselves by something or someone we hate rather than the love to which Christ calls us? That last one hits the best of us, even as it hits the worst of us. I mean, it's hit us Christians from time immemorial, throughout our history, from the Crusades to the Inquisition to the religious wars of the Protestant Reformation to the manifest destiny in our own country to today. We're still making enemies solely to unite one group against another. How often are we, as Christians, defined more by what we hate than the ways that we love? Defined more by the enemies we create than the love of a God who created all of us? It's easy to look at Haman and say he's pure evil. It's easy to look at Putin and his cronies and say they're pure evil, but maybe the more difficult work of seeing the pieces of Haman or Putin within us, maybe that's the more important work. Maybe that's the holier work. Because it's the work of Lent of acknowledging the truth within ourselves so that we might return to our true selves in Christ. Amen? Amen.